Hello, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters. So we're going to once again launch into Hamlet, and it's been a while since we've done one of these. I feel as though I've left everyone in Medias race there at the end of Act 2. And so we're going to pick up here at Act 3 in Hamlet. And if you recall, I've been stressing throughout this series of readings the, uh, the idea of the scholastic debate, the debate about images, the struggle between whether images have any connection to something substantial beyond this world, or whether images are mere convenience created by us as rational creatures in order to survive in the world, in order to manipulate the world. Hamlet seems to have had an education of this sort at Wittenberg College, and he has there run up against the, uh, the stumbling block, the wall, that the images and ideas and words that he has uh, are mere fictions of the imagination, that they are there in order to be able to deal with a purely materialistic world, and they have no connection to anything divine or anything beyond this world. And that's a problem for him, certainly, because uh, that's a problem for a lot of people. Um, because if there is nothing beyond this world, then what's the point of anything? What's the point of even being alive, right? Uh, and Hamlet uh, seems to have wrestled with this as though it's as though for him the the God, the divine being who gives the law and gives order and structure to our life has been killed and been replaced by a fake God uh, who is now uh, not not quite the same image that we had before of what God is. And that is uh, metaphorically um, dealt with in the character of the father, Hamlet Sr., being killed, and Claudius, the fake uh, father, taking over. So here in Act 3, we have what is undoubtedly one of the most famous speeches of Shakespeare in all of his corpus, and maybe even one of the most famous speeches in English literature, period. I refer, of course, to the to be or not to be speech. And this has been done by numerous actors and performers. And uh, when I when I read it tonight, um, I'm not planning to go up against people like Benedict Cumberbatch, for instance, or uh, or, or even Mel Gibson. Um, I'm just going to read it because uh, to me it's one of those great speeches which embodies the whole struggle we've been talking about here about whether or not our existence has meaning or whether our existence is purely futile, right? And to decide that question makes one in a state almost like, like when it's crucified, you know, you, you, it's like you're nailed to this cross of the material world and you can't ascend uh, to the tension of which is, uh, is tremendous. So we're gonna go ahead and read act three, uh, scene one, and I'm going to uh, focus, I think on that speech predominantly in the after commentary here. Hopefully you have your copy ready with you, and you, hopefully you have some kind of ooh, lemonade or something, because it's it's really it's thick out tonight, definitely. A very murky, uh, thick evening. Looks like there's going to be rain here in Minnesota. It's a murky evening in, in a great many places in the U.S. right now, but uh, we won't comment on that. We open with the king, Claudius, and Queen Gertrude, who are speaking with Polonius, who, remember, Polonius is a court fool who's always trying to gain uh, recognition in the court. And then Ophelia, his daughter, and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and Lords attendant. The king opens. And can you by no drift of conference get from him why he puts on this confusion, grating so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy? Rosencrantz says, he does confess he feels himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. Guildenstern, nor do we find him forward to be sounded, but with a crafty madness keeps aloof. When we would bring him on to some confession of his true state. Did he receive you well? Says Gertrude. Uh, most like a gentleman. But with much forcing of his disposition, 
Miss Guildenstern. They got off question, but of our demands most free in his reply. Did you assay him to any pastime? Madam, it so fell out that certain players uh, we overwrought on the way. And these we told him, and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear of it. They are here about the court, and as I think they have already ordered this knight to play before him. "'Tis most true," says Polonius, "'and he beseeched me to entreat your majesties "'to hear and see the matter." "'With all my heart,' says the king, "'and it doth much content me to hear him so inclined. "'Good gentlemen, give him a further edge "'and drive his purpose into these delights.' "'We shall, my lord,' says Rosencrantz. "'And he and Guildenstern exit. "'Sweet Gertrude, Leave us, too, for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither, that, as twere by accident, may hear affront of Ophelia. Her father and myself, lawful espials, will so bestow ourselves that, seeing unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge, and gather by him as he is behaved, if be the affliction of his lover, no, that thus he suffers more. I shall obey you says the queen, and for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wonted way again. To both your honours. Madam, I wish it may, says Ophelia. And the queen exits. Ophelia, walk you here. Uh, gracious, uh, so please you. We will bestow ourselves. Uh, read on this book. Hmm? That show of such an exercise may color your loneliness. We are oft to blame in this. Tis too much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action we do sugar o'er the devil himself. Oh, tis too true, says the king. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience. The harlot's cheek beautied with plastering art is not more ugly to the thing that helps it than is my deed to my most painted word. No heavy burden. There, I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. Enter Hamlet. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing to end them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It's a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. <laughs> to sleep, perchance, to dream. I. Therein lies the rub. <laughs> For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil? Must give us pause. <laughs> There's the respect. It makes calamity of so long life. But who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, 
and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. When he himself might his own quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will. It makes us rather bear those hills we have than to fly to those we know not. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with a pale cast of thought. In enterprises of great pitch and moment with disregard, their courses run awry and lose the name of action. Softly now. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. <laughs> Good my lord, how does your your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank ye. Well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed, long to re-deliver. I pray you now to receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honor, Lord, you know right well you did. And with them, words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. The perfume lost. Take these again. For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. <laughs> Are you honest? My lord. Are you fair? But what means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Ay, truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bawd than the force of honesty can translate beauty into its likeness. This was sometimes a paradox, but now the time gives it a proof. I did love you once indeed my lord you made me believe so you should not have believed me i loved you not virtue cannot so inoculate your old stock we shall relish of it i was the more deceived get thee to a nunnery why was sabi a breeder of sinners I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that were better my mother had not borne me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my back than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape, or time to act them in. What would such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? We are errant knaves, all oh, believe not of us. Go thy ways, to a nunnery. Where's your father? Uh, at home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his house. Farewell. Oh, help me this way. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as Chaste as ice and as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery. 
farewell. Or if thou will needs marry, marry a fool, for wise men know well enough what monsters make of them. To an honorary go, and quickly to farewell. I have heard of your paintings well enough. God hath given you one face, and you make yourselves another. You dig, and you amble, and you you're lisp, and you nickname God's creatures, and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to. I'll no more than it. It has made me mad. I say we will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all save one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. Nunnery, go. And he exits. Oh, what a noble mind is here our throne. The courtier soldier scholar's eye, tongue of sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the absurd of all observers, quite, quite well. And I have ladies most abject and wretched. Suck the honey of his music vows. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of time and harsh, that unmatched form and nature, stature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen. See what I see. The king advances. Love? His affections do not that way tend. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul, o'er which his melancholy sits in brood. And I do not doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. Which, for to prevent, I have, in quick determination, thus set it down. He shall with speed to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. Haply, the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart. Ron, his brain still beating, puts him thus from fashion of himself. What think you of it? Oh, it shall do well, says Bologna. But yet I do believe the origin and commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. How now, Ophelia, you need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. My lord, do as you please. But uh, if you hold it fit after the play, let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his grief. <laughs> let her be round with him. I'll be placed. I'll be placed. So please you. In the ear of all their conference, if she find him not to England, send him or confine him where your wisdom best shall think. It shall be so. Madness and great ones must not unwatched go. So there's the end of that. I love that ending too. Shakespeare always has these endings for his uh, scenes, or frequently has these endings for his scenes, where he has a, uh, a royal couplet. You know that the lines um, rhyme at the very end. So it's an iambic pentameter, but then it's two words that rhyme together, and it has this force, this dynamism that sticks in the in the ear, and you know, oh, the scenes definitely end, and you know, it's like dun dun dun, dun. you know, this ending. It's great. I love it. It shall be so, badness and great ones must not unwatched go. Well, one, you know, immediately you could touch up and say, well, why shouldn't madness and great ones unwatched go? I think it's because the king doesn't think Hamlet's actually mad. I think he thinks that Hamlet is pretending to be mad so that uh, he can get uh, a leg up on Polonius or, or on, on uh, Claudius so that he can actually find a way to, to kill Claudius and take his throne. Why does he think that? Well, I think it's because Claudius himself did that to his brother. And if you want to take a meta talk a metaphor, it's almost like like that fake god now is out to get you. 
you know, <laughs> that fake father's out to get you. And he, uh, he perceives that you are treacherous because he is treacherous. Hmm. So he's going to send Hamlet to England. And as we find out later, he's sending him to England not to get the tribute, but to get him killed in England. So that's going to come later. But um, right now he's planning just to send him away to England. Remember, this is an English play, but it's it's set in Denmark. So, you know, to send him to England would be during the Dane law. Uh, Denmark actually controlled all of the eastern part of England in those areas now that are called like uh, Sussex and Wessex and, and um, Northumbria and that, all, that whole area. But that was all controlled by the Danes. And so when he's sending Hamlet over there to England, it's in order to get the tax, the tribute from the English that have been conquered by the Danes. But um, Polonius still thinks that it's all due to love that Hamlet has lost his marbles. He doesn't think that Hamlet's play acted. Why? Because I think Polonius, on the one hand, is a fool. But also, I think, because, you know, and he's a fool not just because he doesn't see the political possibility, because I don't think he does, but he's a fool also because he, he takes what I think is a tremendous crisis for Hamlet, this crisis of faith and of soul and reality, and he reduces it to hormones. You know, oh, it's nothing but a hormonal problem. You know, oh, it's nothing but he needs a girl. That's really, that's basically what's going on here with Polonius. He's saying, oh, it just needs a girl. A good squeeze will solve everything. <laughs> In the immortal words of the Cohen brothers, would that it were so simple. <laughs> um, if it were that simple, then there would be a lot less uh, angst and ennui and all those other French things that we suffer under, this, this sense of, of uh, failure and the sense that, that, that we're alone in the universe. It's not good for man to be alone, right? And yet, I suppose you could say that Ophelia could be the answer to Hamlet's problems in a different setting, in a different world. But they're not the answer here, because she is betrayed. She's betrayed by Hamlet because she's betraying him already. She's been put up to it by her father to betray Hamlet. And she takes what I think was probably a very decent love, a very decent romance, and she twists it in order to try and ferret out from Hamlet his deepest, darkest self, his deepest, deepest motivation. Why? Because her father has put her up to it. And as somebody commented, she's in a bad spot because now she has to choose between the love of her father and the love of her, her man, her Hamlet. And she chooses her father. Woe is her. And so she betrays Hamlet's love. She's convinced also by her brother, uh, Laertes, who says, be careful with Hamlet because he's too powerful. He's too high up on the food chain, so to speak. And, and you're going to get hurt if you give your love to him or give your chastity to him. Um, and so she is already kind of predisposed to say, well, if I have to choose between father and Hamlet, I choose father. So here she is, and she betrays this love that they probably had, gives him back these trinkets, these, these love ornaments, you know, uh, whatever they would have been, jewelry or love letters or whatever. She gives them back and says, you know, now that you have been unfaithful to me, they don't have any flavor to them, so I'm giving them back and cutting our romance off. And that's, I think, I think Hamlet, <laughs> Hamlet, who was kind of playful with her before, kind of sees something is afoot. Why would she do this now? Why is she betraying me now? Why is she cutting off the relationship now? And that's why he goes off on this, on this tremendous tangent with her, which is a, it, it, it rails against her. You know, it says, get you, thee to a nunnery, which on the one hand, a nunnery means to get to a cloister, you know, become a nun, because when you're a nun, you don't produce children, allegedly. And so get thee to a nunnery, be holy and get thee to a nunnery. But it has a double meaning in Shakespeare, because nunnery is also a house of ill repute, where... Uh, uh, women would go who were, um, uh, well, they, were, they were women who were not respectable, <laughs> would go. And so he's, he's insulting her at the same time that he's saying, get out of this court, get out of this situation, get away from us all. We're errant knaves all. I love the line here where he says, I am myself indifferent on us, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am going to do things and I'm capable of doing things that are so horrible that it would be better I was never even born. So I may be honest now, but you you, you don't know what I'm, I'm going to be doing, and I don't want you around when I do them either. And I think partly that's to drive her away from him completely so that she doesn't get hurt. 
but at the same time, uh, it's also that um, I think he's pissed. I think he's I mean, he's angry at her. He's, he gets really enraged at the fact that she is being willingly consenting to be this pawn in this political game that goes on. And then there's this great line that he says about her. I have heard of your paintings well enough. God hath given you one face and you make yourselves another. You jig and amble and lisp. You nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. That's great. Because it's hearkening back to Genesis on the one hand, the book of Genesis, where Adam calls all the creatures up and names them all and then says, none of these will be my helpmate. And so God makes Genesis 2. God makes a helpmate for him, Eve, and Eve comes to uh, live with Adam as his partner, meet for him. Uh, and, and Eve has this reputation of nicknaming the creatures. She's playful. She's joyful. She, she renames everything. No, that's, not, that's, not a, uh, that's not a butterfly. That's a flutterby. You know? that's, not, uh, that's not a, a bird of this type. That's a bird of this type. It's a Katie did or whatever it is. It's a, it's a whippoorwill. So Eve has this, this, this habit of renaming everything, being playful about the world, and, and uh, a very fertile imagination where she's just producing new ideas all the time. Well, that's a good thing on the one hand, but it's also a re harkening back to this conversation about the scholastic debate in that uh, she, Ophelia, women, the feminine force, is that that represents that power in human beings to be playful with words, to redo things so that you rename them something that they're not, or you give them a playful name, or you you turn words around or twist them around or alter them around, uh, and you make poetry and you make uh, rhymes and you make um, nicknames for things, and in doing so, as it says, you jig and amble, you know, you dance around, you, you're playful. And, and in this situation, Hamlet's saying, I've heard that you do this, and it's a bad thing. Why can't you be honest? Why can't you just say what the thing is? You, know, you, you, you have this habit of saying euphemisms all the time and saying uh, phrases rather than just being direct. And because of that, his world has been turned upside down. Because what's behind all those phrases and turns of phrases and rhymes and and jokes and stories, where, where are all those things? They, they obscure the reality and they pile on top of each other, meaning that doesn't have any connection to anything. Because at the heart of the thing, you know, if, 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 if you take the, um, uh, the example, for instance, of naming a creature something else, okay? Let's say uh, we, we had a, a bird and its real name was, uh, I don't know, um, Brachiosaurus, Technicarus, or something like that. And then, well, that's not that. That's a, that's a goldfinch. Well, it's not a goldfinch. It's a little goldie. Well, it's not a little goldie. It's a little to to who? You know, and you go through this series of, like, names for the thing that take it further and further from a scientific, concrete, serious name. And if you're trying to find the reality of the thing, well, is it in that concrete name or is it in the fact that it goes to it to woo if you call it a twit to woo you know uh and if for instance you take that serious name the next thing would be well what where is the bird itself is the bird itself in the feathers or in the flesh or in the bone or in the guts you take it all apart you tear it apart you no longer have a bird you just have pieces so what's at the heart of it where's the heart of the bird where's the where's the the, the birdness that makes the bird and Hamlet, in his struggles, say there is no birdness, but just matter, right? The, the birdness, if it existed, would be connected to a logos, to an order and structure, which would make the little feathered creature, which would have that technical name, which then could be played with in terms of changing its name and altering it, and making jokes and stories and laughing and singing and having a great time. But all that humor and joy comes from that connection to the logos. If there is no connection to the logos, it's just matter. You can't find the bird anymore. You're searching through the feathers and the guts, and there's no bird. It's just stuff. And that's a problem. Because that leads then to that great speech. Because at heart, that's what Hamlet is wrestling with. If there's nothing there but the, but the birds and the, the feathers and the, and the guts and the skin, 
What's the point? What's the purpose? Everything is waiting to become bird, to become worm food. You know, the bird is 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 not something that flies in the sky, and makes beautiful song, and uh, and has color and and and, and um, loveliness to it. It's just worm food waiting to happen. So if that's the case, then I, Hamlet, the individual, why should I exist? Why should I be? Why just not be? Why, why cease to be? And why not cease to be? He's talking about suicide, by the way, in this, in this speech. And if, 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 if you didn't get that drift, the line is, his own quietus make with a bare bodkin. A bodkin's a knife. Quietus is sleep, death, suicide. Who would suffer all these things, Hamlet says, without any purpose to life? Who would suffer the, the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Who would endure being insulted? Who would endure being cut off from other people? Who would endure being rejected in love or demoted or fired? Or If there was no purpose beyond this world. Because if you're going to get fired, you might as well torch the place if there's no purpose, right? If you are going to be rejected in love, you, you might as well go violent if there's no if there's no purpose to life. You know, I can't help but comment on the current situation. We see so much violence right now in our world. Not just violence as in burning things and beating other people up, although that does exist. We also see verbal violence, yelling and screaming and alteration of words and, and visual violence in, in, in movies and um, violence in architecture, if you will, and violence in, in musical styles. And I, I can't help but think that, that that violence, that kind of rage, gets called up because there is no purpose beyond this world for so many people. If there were purpose beyond this world, you would have a reason to be to exist. If there is no purpose beyond this world, your only reason to exist is to make as big a splash as you can before you become worm food. And Hamlet's bringing that very thing up. He says, the only thing that keeps us from, from not enduring these things, the only thing that keeps us enslaved to our boss or to our job or to our family or to our duties, is that we're afraid, we're cowards. We have a cowardly um, fear of that undiscovered country. But what we really want, because this is such a burden, life is such a burden, it's so long life. What we really want is just to sleep, just to quiet, end it. And keep that word in mind, by the way, sleep, he says, by a sleep, to die to sleep, and by a sleep we say to end the heartache and thousand natural shots that flesh is heir to. That, that idea of sleeping, keep that in mind, it'll come up later on in the play. But he says that what we desire is to sleep, to end all of this. And the only thing that prevents us from doing so is that we're cowards. We're frightened of what's going to come afterwards. And that's a very dark vision. I'm not saying Hamlet's right. I'm saying that he is a very dark vision here because if, for instance, we had the vision that we are working towards the new Jerusalem or that we're working towards the happiness of all human beings or that we're working to do the will of the Lord or that we're working to fit into the Logos or even that we're working to, to maintain the balance of the universe, sort of a, a, a Buddhist way of looking at it. Even if we had that, we would have very positive, much more positive motive for doing what we do. But as it is, Hamlet is saying that none of that is reality, he says. All that is subordinated to this fear, this cowardice, this, uh, this fear of the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. That is, after we die, we cross over this, uh, this sea, this ocean, and we go to this undiscovered country, right? And from whose born, whose beach, no traveler ever returns from that. So it's like this, this country beyond there. And we're, we're frightened of it. What if, what if we, what if we uh, went violent and then we died and we found out that there was a judge and the judge judged us for being too violent? Or what if we took our own life and we died and we went to the next world and we found out that the judge didn't like that and we would be punished? 
That's why we don't take our own life, or we don't go violent, and that's why we endure the things that we endure. Not because they give us joy, not because they are the right thing to do, not because they, um, they, they motivate us to build heaven on earth, or maintain the balance, or do the will of the Lord. Rather, we, we endure the fartles, that we, who would fartles bear? We, we endure to grunt and sweat under a weary life because of dread. Dread, fear of something after death. And he says, that's why we are all cowards. Conscience, right, makes cowards of us all. And in this case, conscience is conscientia, with knowledge, conscientia, with knowledge of that other world. If we didn't have knowledge of that other world, the sky would be the limit. Anything would go. If we didn't have knowledge of that other world, we'd be like any other animal. And we would just do what we had to do to survive and to gain pleasure and to reproduce the species. As it is, we have this terrible, terrible burden of being conscious. And our consciousness, our awareness of our situation, the fact that we suffer and we know that we suffer, that makes us different from every other animal. And because we have a knowledge of the afterlife, from where it comes, we don't know. We have a knowledge of the afterlife, and that causes us to be cowardly, to dread things, and not to boldly go where no one has gone before, where no man has gone before. And I like it, you know, in this speech, there's a lot in this speech. It's, it's just it's this incredibly powerful testimony to the struggle that it goes through between uh, images having a purpose or point and images having no purpose or point. But it's also interesting how it's situated because you see movie versions where this comes as an isolated event, like with the Mel Gibson version. You see movies that are slavishly um, uh, faithful to the text, like the, the the one done by Kenneth Branagh. You see other versions which are really remarkably set, like um, there's one with uh, Ethan Hawke where he does the to be or not to be speech in a blockbuster video which for the younger set out there was there was a time when you'd go and rent videos from a store uh, instead of streaming them. And um, the setting of this speech makes a world of difference. The Mel Gibson one, it does it in, um, in a tomb surrounded by bones. And the Kenneth Brown he does with mirrors all around. And then in the, uh, the, the, the blockbuster one, when you're seeing all those images, all this, that fakery and you know, fake stuff blowing up, and you're debating whether to kill yourself. Very powerful stuff. But in this play, it's situated in between a scene where uh, Claudius and Polonius are, are plotting to use Ophelia to catch Hamlet. And Hamlet comes on, and they're all, you know, they're all listening to this. I know it's a soliloquy, right? It's, it's a speech that's given to himself and his own thoughts. But they're listening to it. And then shove Ophelia into the mix. Send her in. And Ophelia goes in immediately, and then it comes, you know, this exchange between Hamlet and Ophelia. So the, the to kill myself speech, the to be or not to be speech, is sandwiched between the political intrigue of Claudius and Polonius and that political intrigue that Ophelia, his best beloved, is actually engaging in as well. If you say that, you know, it's not right for man to be alone because his thoughts tend to this to be or not to be speech, then the obvious thing would be to give him a partner. A, a woman to help him out or for a woman to give him a, a, her a man to help her out. Uh, somebody who could help them through this crisis that they're having. And Shakespeare takes that and tropes it and says, well, here is the person who could help Hamlet, but she's a traitor like the others are traitors too. And finally, at the, at the end of the speech, I love how he says, you know, we lose the name of action. These enterprises of great pitch and moment. All enterprises of great pitch and moment lose their name of action when we start considering this purpose or purposelessness, what the Greek called telos. When we when we lose that sense of telos or end goal or purpose, then suddenly we are in the realm of achidia, 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 however you want to pronounce it, which is this purposelessness drifting. And so we lose the name of action. Even though the action here is to kill himself, to be realistic, so it's glad glad that he doesn't lose that that uh, purpose. But all action kind of loses its purpose in the face of this. 
And if that, folks, if that's the end result of subscribing to the nominalist position, well, you can judge for yourselves, but it seems to me Shakespeare is saying it's a lethal, lethal way to look at the world. As a philosophy to be adopted, Shakespeare says here, and also in other plays like Romeo and Juliet, for instance, um, to adopt the nominalist position is, is, is lethal to life. The, uh, the, the realist may have its problems. You know, the realist position may have its problems. But to adopt the nominalist position, whew, boy, you're, once, you're one bare bodkin away from making your own quietus. Well, we'll pick this up as soon as I can again, and I really appreciate your listening in. And hopefully if any of this strikes home or if you appreciate any of this, uh, leave a comment. Check out uh, my Patreon page. Uh, I always like to give a plug for other people. Um, so I, I give a plug right now for the Claremont Institute and for the American Mind podcast. Really good stuff. I also give a big plug. He doesn't need it, but I'm going to give it anyway for Victor Davis Hansen. I think if you haven't listened to Victor Hansen's uh, uh Speeches on various subjects. He's, he's an absolute delight to listen to. He has some great books about the, the classical world, so I said check him out. And as a third thing, this is going to sound really off the wall for a scholar like myself, if I purport to be a scholar, to endorse. But I just saw the trailer for the Call of Duty uh, Cold War. So check it out. Not, not just because it's... It's, I hope that they can revive the series from the, the pit that they're going to, but also because it has clips from uh, Yuri Bezmenov. And if you haven't listened to Yuri, if you haven't listened to Yuri Bezmenov, wow, just, you know, go and listen to him. If you can catch him on YouTube before they take him down for hate speech, it's not hate speech, but um, if you can listen to him, I, I really encourage you to go check out Yuri Bezmenov. He's wonderful, wonderful um, thinker and, and speaker back in the 1980s. So uh, big plugs for all those folks. And as usual, uh, thanks to everybody for uh, listening in and for um, being with me this evening. Until we meet again, uh, take care, stay safe. God bless you and God bless all those that you love. Uh, safe travels if you're traveling and safe at home if you're at home. So long. <laughs>